if you ever need anything, you can always go to trundle.com. We, you can do license quotes. You can get hands-on keyboard support. We even have a 24-hour quick deploy uh, service that we put together for COVID-19. On that subject, I hope everybody over there is uh, healthy, staying healthy along with their families. Um, you'll uh, you'll see from the raffling here that it is not exactly an enterprise grade raffle. So you'll <laughs> you'll find out what I can manage at home. We'll do it. So uh, we're here to help. Um, rules of engagement: um, fill out the webinar uh, poll. That helps. I'm going to close it pretty soon. So please scramble to go ahead and do that. Um, questions can be asked by voice or by the Q and A slash chat. Q and A is possibly a place where if you really want to come out of this with a specific answer or question asked, uh, our folks on this side will field those questions, give you a short, uh, a shorter response, or give you perspective, and then may bring it up. Uh, we may bring it up vocally uh, to kind of elaborate on it, so it's more of a social topic. Um, so. Uh, but the, the world favors the bold. So if you, uh, depending on what you wanna cover, and by the way, from the poll results so far, and I'll publish it, I'll publish it in about a minute. Um, uh, we have pretty diverse interests here. So um, that's great, but also it can be hard with uh, steering things and what we show visually if we end up demoing certain features or things like that. Um, but either way, if you don't get the one-on-one -on -one time you needed, um, this is just a single webinar. We got another webinar on the 23rd of the same ilk. And uh, we have email addresses and phone numbers that you guys can reach us at. So um, it should be uh, helpful either way to engage with us. Um, let me share the results of the poll for it so everybody can see it. There. You guys are even Steven on that first question almost. But I'm glad that most people just want to sit and learn. So that's, that's great. Um, and. Okay, no one is a uh, number five on the toilet paper issue, which is great. Um, awesome. Uh, cool. So, um, here, well, we're going to watch this great animation of the Blinko game. But uh, into maybe 20 minutes into this, guys, we're going to run. I have a little Plinko game here that we were supposed to use at the last scene summit. Um, and of course, summit was canceled. So, uh, we're giving away $25 Amazon gift cards. Or if you feel so charitable, we can donate that money to a charity of your choice. Uh, so, um, but given today's uh, environment, I understand either choice you would make in that, in that instance. What I would like you, for you guys to do, you all have my email address. Uh, just write me an email and in the subject line, pick one of those Atlassian products right there. Uh, I actually have a little Plinko game right here and it, we'll drop a ball and it'll fall in one of those spots. And if it lands on the one you picked from your email in the subject line, uh, you win. So uh, over the course of this webinar, go ahead and send me that email, picking one of those products and sending it, sending it to my email, okay? Sound good? Clear as mud for everybody? No questions? Who doesn't like Plinko? Who doesn't like Plinko? Exactly. Awesome. So. People, uh, folks, you can start firing away on the, the Q&A little chat field there. Um, let the good times roll. Again, uh, let's, let's favor the bolt here. Um, based on the polling, let's see. Uh, I have so one person answered, I have a specific Atlassian configuration question or challenge to solve. Whoever answered that one, I'm nominating you to bring that up first. And I think I've allowed, made everybody unmutable, so you can unmute yourself. And if anybody feels like their audio is still not coming through on Zoom, uh, we may have to defer to chat. Otherwise, if that person um, can't speak up or won't speak up, we can um, let anybody else who's, uh, who wants to, to speak up and start either sharing things, asking questions about the Atlassian stack, about you know, native functionalities, whatever it is. This is how organized I am right now for this, this webinar, so let's roll with it. <laughs> oh my gosh, silence. We could start demoing things ourselves if, uh, if, if that is helpful. How about, um, 
How about the question around integrations? Somebody has said that they're interested in learning about integrations. Can anybody elaborate on that? Who answered that one in the poll? Are we allowing anybody, everybody to mute, unmute themselves, Patrick? Is it yeah, everybody can unmute themselves. Okay. Hello, I did not answer that. Can you hear me? Hey, hello, yes. yes. Hello, this is Karen. Hey, uh, as far as integration, um, it wasn't me that uh, checked that, but I wouldn't mind um, um, if you, I don't know if you can cover that topic with Ziblin and integrating that with um, JIRA. Is that one of the topics you can talk about? Zep you said Zeppelin? Mm -hmm. Yes. Know, on our side, guys, do you know Zeppelin? Or anybody else? Because that's integrated, we use it for testing too, and it's integrated mm -hmm. with JIRA, but I don't know exactly. I haven't used that. Feature. Yeah, Patrick, I am also interested to learn about this. Zeppelin, okay. Guys on our end, any initial thoughts? Unfortunately, at least not in any of our current clients use those things, but yeah, I'm just doing some research on the back end. Oh, okay. Oh. At AstraZeneca, we use it quite a bit. And, sorry, hi, this is Chris. Do you use the Zeppelin for JIRA integration on the Atlassian Marketplace? That's what we do, yeah. Yeah, so Chris, I see uh, yeah, the Zeppelin for JIRA add-on that's out there in the Marketplace. So for, for you all, how, how, how well does that integration work? Have you guys had any issues or features that, that aren't there and made available through the add-on? Are you asking me or asking somebody? Yeah, just curious how you all are using that today. I know other teams um, are using it and I don't believe they're having issues, but I, I would like to learn a little more about it because I haven't had the opportunity to use it within my projects. Okay. So uh, let's do, this is Karim, right? Yes. McLaughlin? Okay. Mm -hmm. So Karim, let's, uh, what we'll do on our side, and uh, I think Chris, you spoke up, right? If you have anything else to add, please do. But we can do a little research on our end, and we probably have some follow-up questions. And I um, apologize for the first swing here. We don't have a, an immediate perspective. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about uh, the person who answered about uh, hunting for an add-on for a specific use case and or need? Um, to the person who asked that, do they want to speak up? How about the person who answered about not knowing enough about the full native capabilities of JIRA or other Atlassian tools? And that's a wide topic. That's a, a powerful one for uh, a lot of Atlassian customers to, who haven't had um, sort of a professional perspective um, on, uh, on exploiting those before having a, a zoo of add-ons. Um, can anybody elaborate on that? Who answered that in the poll? And I think we could, if um, that person's not um, totally sure what their question might be, mm -hmm. You have that slide available that we talk about, like the kind of the trifecta or what we know enables both. Yeah, I have it in a separate presentation with Proforma and Automation for Jira and Script Runner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can probably pull that up. Yeah, hold on. I'll stop sharing. Pull that up and let's see if it uh, jars any questions uh, in particular. Because um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. I, uh, hold on a second. Um, we'll see if it jars any other questions uh, related to add-ons, but um, at least in our experience as um, JIRA administrators, and um, we, we see a wide uh, range of use cases, as you can imagine, across um, varying sizes of enterprise. And um, it, it's really twofold. I think one of, the, one of the ways to keep your presentation of what you plan to do or want to do with JIRA, what, or what JIRA is capable of, as an objection to overcome for either some leadership of or answering simply answering the question what's possible 
um, what we find is about 97 or plus percent of our use cases are enabled by, of course, the native JIRA application or JIRA service desk, but then these three add-ons in particular are of high recommendation to enable just about any combination of work or use case you can think of. And that spans not just ITSM or project management or software development teams. We've also, uh, this really lets these three, if you plan on scaling into enterprise service management, such as legal, HR, um, if you have a complex setup where selecting um, automation for certain approvers based on multiple pieces of criteria, um, we have we have those use cases, and um, you know there is a bit of a jungle out there these days. So having these three are what we would consider our own staff picks, um, and what we also know are proven on, on multiple different types of use cases. And um, they can help keep you away from potentially uh, one of these would replace two other potential add-ons. So um, anyway, just wanted to see if that spurred any other questions as far as there's so much out there, but what, how do I scale? And we would absolutely re um, recommend that if you're moving to an enterprise level or even just starting out, put these bricks in your foundation uh, so that you can use them and uh, really the sky's the limit as far as how much imagination you want to put behind these or what it needs to enable. Um, recently, Proforma is now handling a very large legal process for um, one of our clients in Nashville that has a very document heavy uh, process for um, signing new artists. Um, and um, it also comes into play though for dynamic presentation of fields that are only going to be uh, need to be presented for your user and you can keep your overall field profile down so um, or script runner to expand what you can what's possible within your workflows as far as enforcements or automations and then automation for Jira is actually been acquired by Atlassian it is now available on cloud premium if you're not on Cloud Premium, I would highly recommend to upgrade to it to get automation for JIRA and really enable just about any amount of automation that you can think of in both software and service desk. So I'll, I'll shut up on those three, but um, the, these three, um, short of somebody having a specific need, really handle um, uh, almost all of our potential use cases. Daniel, thanks for joining. Daniel, John, um, does that spur any other questions or combinations? I, I, help us out here, guys. Yeah, yeah, I'd like, I'll, I'll help you out. I'd like to jump in. So, hi, guys. It's uh, Chris with uh, Old Street Solutions. We're an app vendor. Um, da Daniel offered to shut up as me immediately after getting interesting, so <laughs> I'd like to stop him there. Um, I, I think there's often a false dichotomy between whether people need automation for Jira when they already have script runner. Um, and, and I think that that conversation is really interesting and really rich uh, to talk about what a lot of people in Jira are looking to do. So yeah. um, do you have any thoughts on sort of the overlap and how you can use automation for Jira in tangent with script runner? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. So where automation for JIRA would require generally a, a trigger point. Um, so let me start at a very high level. Automation for JIRA um, is much easier to set up and configure um, initially. So for a project level administrator that you want to empower with, hey, if you guys want to auto assign based on organization or customer, go for it. Start setting up project specific rules. A project administrator um, with a, a limited amount of training could access this and leverage that very, very simple UI for establish a trigger point, put in your conditions, and then um, you know pick the actions that you want to happen. And so persona. So for the project administrator level person, it's a it's a it's a thing of beauty. It keeps them out of the hair of your of your overall tier administrator for setting up slick, simple automations just for them and their team. 
So how it may work in concert differently with script printer. So I'll give you a use case. Um, we have a, uh, a handful of automations that are running at the project level for uh, an employee onboarding project. However, we're using Script Runner. Uh, while automation is going to assist uh, with that workflow, Script Runner has a custom post function for finding who one of 76 unique approvers are of that type of request based on multiple upstream criteria that were presented in pro forma. So that would be an example of all three of those working in concert. Now, that script was is highly complex, as you can imagine. It's a matrix. And so where one can invoke the other, um, and you can, um, for those, and they're generally much more technical in nature. So that's one use case, I would, by the, at the persona level of how much it needs to handle. So where, you, we could have potentially built that in automation for Jira, but it'd be 76 unique line items, be very difficult to kind of manage versus script runner is going to let us build a very elegant matrix um, with some simple logic on a post function of the workflow uh, without having to find the trigger point, et cetera. And then, um, I, and then I think it comes down to um, supportability. Um, you know, script runner can, be a little more dev centric, uh, I, I think. While it offers a nice additional suite of options in your validators, conditions, post functions, out of box, for anything a little more complex, it's going to require a little more dev heavy uh, type of support person versus automation for Jira for those simple ones that you can uh, train your project administrators to do. So that's the big distinction that we've seen in usage. That's a, that's a major use case um, for overlap. But then um, really, to me, it just comes down to uh, who needs to support what based on the function that it needs to, uh, needs to have, so. A lovely example, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, has anybody ever, uh, seen um, the UI for automation for Jira? If you have not, I can display something here. It's a great one to learn. Generally, this gets most of the uh, oohs and ahs um, of, uh, of how to configure and enable these. You've seen my screen? Yes. Okay. So, um, Cloud Premium, you'll see, is an option here, not to be confused with this line item called automation. <laughs> I'm in Service Desk right now. Um, one of the things I also like versus Script Runner, Script Runner, I, I might have to have administrative privileges to toggle them on and off um, to be able to get into the workflow and enable or disable a, a script versus at a, as a project administrator based on the rules that I've established. Um, I love this quick toggle feature if for whatever reason I need to turn off some of these automations. Um, so let's say I've got a, I've got a couple of these um, built for this project. It basically, I pick a trigger point that, all right, well, when this issue goes from waiting for support to end progress, very simple. If that request type is it's reporting a suspected phishing email, I want three subtasks created on the issue type. Okay, and then I can also add and remove those fields. I can auto assign them. Uh, really, the sky's the limit on what I need to do in order to enable that use case just for my team. I don't have to know Script Runner. I don't have to go in and enable a script that lives on a workflow somewhere potentially. I can just set this up as a project specific rule. Um, those are the rule details. But then if I want to go back and uh, let's say I might have an issue, uh, I get a very simple UI. Um, tells me whether something changed or was successful, and I can uh, immediately see which issues it applied to. Then if I want to go take a look at that one. <laughs> Any Coming to America fans out there? No. Uh, you can see these three were automatically created while we're way out of SLA on this guy. Um, and uh, um, you know that's one way to keep, keep that on task. Where with Script Runner too, then I could do potentially a little more on enforcing what happens with those subtasks. Do they have to be in a certain status? 
um, whether I'm going to set up a new blocking condition or I can have script runner go dig into those a little bit more for audit trail purposes, whatever the case uh, might be. So, um, so the UI, once, once people see that, uh, it gives your project administrators a ton of confidence in being able to handle that. And then you can get that load off of your, your project administrators um, or your site level administrators for enabling a team with, with custom scripting. And um, then they can self-manage, toggle them on and off, so it becomes a nice uh, workforce balancer on, on uh, letting these teams uh, build this kind of stuff. Here's another example. Uh, when an issue is created, uh, if request type equals unplanned changed, and it's the highest priority, I need a uh, custom email sent to the site admins, right? So staying out of the hair of your notification scheme is always nice. You can leave it at your defaults or you know, toggle those on and off. Use automation to send those um, what if emails. Uh, that's one of our other recommendations to, to keep your notification scheme simple because we all know Jira is very chatty. Um, so let's take a look at what it looks like if I'm creating a brand new one. Um, you get a nice, very robust suite of trigger points and they're always adding to it. Um, and uh, so if I, I can pick really anything, but um, let's say if a, a common one uh, issue has been commented on and um, I wanna check if it, um, if it matches a JQL, we'll just do a fields condition. If that's an issue type of uh, one of uh, HR or finance, you guys get the idea. So if they add a comment to one of these two, then um, pick a <laughs> pick your poison. Uh, we can edit. I'll just send an email, and then I can program who it goes to. I can program what it says and pull in Jira fields, and I can pull fields into the body of that email just for whichever reason um, or what how. So sky's the limit. Really, the use cases are beyond a mile wide of teams that use both automation and script runner in different ways, but generally we find this up at the project administrator level so they can manage their team and manage their notifications better. So uh, if you can pull that slide back up, Patrick. I shall. Then I'll pause there. Is anybody familiar with Proforma? I've had beers with the founder, but never actually seen the app. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, automation, automation for Jira. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Okay. Uh, let's say uh, there's a, I'm trying to write a rule wherein uh, uh, if an issue is uh, going from to do to done and it has a, a transition any to any, like if it goes to in progress, it can go again to open. So uh, I'm trying to write a rule where, wherein if it in if the issue goes in in progress, so three subtasks should be created. But how can I restrict uh, not to create a duplicate task? Uh, duplicate subtask. Um, you got to put in a condition that says. Hang on one sec. Let me reshare here. Yep. Um, Hey, while we're transitioning here, I just want to let people know, I think I've only received three emails with people's guesses for the Plinko game, which is very important that we do the Plinko game. So anybody who's not written me with a product, uh, last name product in the subject line, guessing what it is, <laughs> get on it or else there's only three for the Plinko game. Jeff, continue. <laughs> Thanks, Wink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so uh, I just would add a new condition then before it creates the, uh, the uh, subtask. And uh, let's see here. It's a related issue condition. Ah, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, yeah, subtasks are not present, uh, but you can basically block it if subtasks are or aren't present. So it sounds like it's going back and forth and it's recreating a subtask every time. 
uh, use the related issues link and only um, tell it to create a subtask unless they're present, if they're not present. So if subtasks aren't present on this project, it'll then create three subtasks. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. No problem. Yeah, that one gets us because uh, we love all, all the enablement and then yeah, the team actually starts working and yeah, we, we found that one the hard way too. Okay, um, let's take a look at pro forma. Um, and really guys, what we, what we for anybody that's your administrator is potentially facing um, other questions like, well, well can it, can, why can't I get dynamic form presentation? That's number one, I would say, is what this enables. And we'll, well, got a use case here we can walk through. Um, but then secondarily, how can I create a form but not blow up custom fields and still present those in the UI to a customer? And then the third thing, is enabling a form to be editable after your um, users submit the form. They could form uh, ed edit fields. We have other use cases for that, and I can talk through some of those. So uh, these become, again, sky's the limit on your imagination. So essentially what it does is it replaces what you would present into, um, for Jira, from a Jira service desk perspective, out on the portal UI. I'll talk about that. You can see which request types of these are associated to. Secondarily, if it's just a Jira software project, instead of creating custom fields, here's a prime example of uh, another process right now we're working on where they need to add a um, payment requisition form to a, a, proje a project issue type, but not all of them apply. That'll just be added at the right time of a workflow. It won't create custom fields. It's not mapped to anything. It's just a form. Another way to get data on your Jira issues without creating more custom fields, keep your custom field community pretty low. So um, to build a form, um, I would just go into create, but let's take a look at one here. So uh, employee onboarding um, is a very popular use case right now for HR service desks. So what you'll see is your line items are called questions, and then I can add sections. So this being a section here, and then I can choose whether or not the fields in that section are gonna show conditionally or always. So anytime, I, so if we select here, so office, what you'll see on the, on the portal form, it's only gonna show conditionally if um, they say remotely or in an office, this section's only gonna show if that previous selection, which is, uh, right here is selected. So now you can start doing dynamic form presentations. So instead of having these very long forms, depending on what your customers are giving you, um, then you can represent, you can present those fields. So, um, and then they're mapped to, uh, to Jira fields. So if I go take a look at this one, I can link it to a Jira field or not. So if there's an existing Jira field you wanna link that to, great. Um, if not, it, it will just stay as a field on the form. And yeah, I'll, we'll show how that looks. So, um, so building up the forms is pretty simple. There's a new version of script, or um, pardon me, um, pro forma out there that I think lets a little more like tables and side by side, wiki style renders, uh, that kind of thing. So we're, we haven't gotten, but this is the existing version. So let me close this guy and then um, it's just, I've already got it associated with just one request type, employee onboarding. So let me raise a request. And let's see here. It's an under, which one's it under? HR. Okay, employee onboarding. Now what you're looking at, this is pro forma. That form, you see it's loading. There it is. So summary being a Jira field is fine, but all of this, it looks just like Jira service desk. However, this is pro forma. But what you'll see is, it, depending on my selection here, if I say office, then office um, promotes, which, uh, let's see here. Oh, if I say contractor, I'm gonna get the contractor end date. So one way just to, uh, intakes everything in my book, getting the right data the first time is excellent not 
overwhelming your customer with presenting fields that you may or may not need to collect on certain types of forms, and then presenting a really slick, dynamic experience. So that's what Proforma affords you. Then of course, in coordination with automation, depending on what you want it to look at, so with automation for JIRA, uh, Proforma has a couple of automations of its own. Um, you can advance workflows, do certain things with field forms, et cetera. Again, the sky's the limit. So um, let's take a look then at what that looks like. Uh, I think I've done an employee onboarding. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so if I wanted it, what does that look like post-submission? Here's the form. Now, right now I have it set where these forms are editable even after the customer has submitted them. So this is a huge use case and it's gaining a lot of popularity. So two use cases, one is um, for, I've mentioned that legal process, that it's a very draft heavy process, but they don't wanna create JIRA power users. They just want them coming out here and building these things out before they submit them for approval. So if there's work to do before the agent can close the form, I can go in here and edit um, uh, everything. Be like, oh no, I meant that to be Chicago and their new contractor end date. We've done some negotiation changes. Now let me go ahead and save that. And on the JIRA side of the ticket, all of these have been updated. Now if I submit it, that essentially closes the form and then what we can do in that case is as soon as a form is submitted, then advance the status of like, this is official. So um, I had another use case where they had a, a global uh, external team submitting things to the home office. Those needed to be editable until they were fully submitted. So in a way, their external customers, this kind of became a workbench for them to, instead of an email, um, they could organize their thoughts, start building on a form, and then eventually uh, go ahead and submit that. Yep, I want to submit it. And then depending on what you want to build, you can build a quick automation that says, all right, well, when that form is submitted, you can see it's locked, uh, locked for editing now. But when that form is submitted, uh, I can't edit it. I can get a PDF of it if I need to. So if I'm the legal team, that might be nice. I'm not sure why that's doing that. <laughs> not shaking. But if I go look at that from an agent point of view, <clears throat> any Smokey and the Bandit fans out there, I see I've got the form. Look at how clean this form is. There's nothing on it because everything is here. All right. But if I, but if I go ahead and uh, click on this, I'm going to get the form. I can see everything that I need uh, that's coming with this. I can, of course, advance it. But if, let's say if I've got an issue and I need to reopen this for the customer, I can go ahead and reopen that. And then it'll be available for editing back out on the customer portal. Another use case that we have for this is um, customers are requesting, when they request uh, new development items, lots of back and forth. What's changing? Oh, <laughs> for lack of a better term, what's changing is the uh, success criteria potentially, uh, or the uh, user story itself. So um, that enables that back and forth with the customer on, on key fields until, uh, as, you, as you saw, I can lock the, I can lock the form uh, or I can uh, bring it back to being internal. But um, as soon as I submit a form, it is now locked until I reopen it uh, for the customer. So if I go back out to the customer request, it's uneditable at this certain stage. So for those of you that might have some round robin type, you know, back and forth stuff on gathering info on the front end, especially if you're Jira service desk, this is a great um, this is a great way to enable that. Enable the dynamic forward presentation. Enable um, post submission issue editing. And then the other, again, the other big benefit is you can keep your custom fields to a minimum if they don't have to necessarily always be mapped to a JIRA field. <clears throat> Any questions? Do, do forms sort of take the place of a screen or are they layered on top of or in some way part of a screen? If 
They are Jira fields. You can make them a screen. From a portal perspective, they take over your um, uh, request type intake form. So if I go here, you'll see that it looks blank. So if I go to this uh, HR service catalog here, and this guy, if I go look at the fields, um, you'll see really it's only summary because the form is displaying the rest. Approvers have been hidden, hidden, but that answer your question. So I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, and I assume that Proformer also works with regular uh, Jira as well as service desk. Sure. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, what I'm trying to figure out is, is someone in our organization really recently raised the question of, hey, I want to have a custom field, and when the value in that custom field on the, on the screen is edited, I want to then ask for three more things. And yep. so I was thinking, well, if I had this done with, you know, in other words, could the, could the view screen on an issue be a pro forma form so that when they edited that field, I could look at the conditional thing and say, oh, they changed it to this, so I now have to ask for A, B, and C in addition. Yes. So, um, yeah, go, that field would present, so let me... Um, I so the, the, the form is sort of connected via the, the, yes. the field itself, right? Correct. And okay. so if you, if you then open the form, edit it, and then there's a conditional value. So if I go into this guy here, and I reopen it for editing, it open, yes. and there were conditional things that show. So if I say FTE, see that one disappeared? But let's say if that one wasn't there, and you go in to edit the form, and I put in uh, the contractor and then add that, that'll link all the way back to your ticket. So whatever you add to the form also syncs to your ticket and vice versa. Right. Yep. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Sounds like you got a good solution there coming. Well, yeah, based on budget. <laughs> yeah, getting getting plugins may be technically easy, but financially challenging. Understood. We can help with that too. If you guys need like an extended evaluation of some sort, give us a call and we can try to help organize uh, as much of that as possible for you. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. If you guys want, if you guys are, want to look at it and go, God, I really need like three months to prove this out um, or cut into the cost somehow, something along those lines, uh, we're always uh, willing to, uh, to help work something out. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Guys. Hey Jeff. So we had a couple of uh, written questions in one from uh uh, Monica Sharma, she said, uh, I want to use Jira for automation, but I can uh, see there's only two options uh, to install basically server or data center, but she's using Jira Cloud. Um, how can she use it with uh, the existing Jira Cloud? So probably the opportunity to talk about the, the shift for automation into the native yep. Jira Cloud. Got to go to Cloud Premium to get it. I think, uh, Jeff, uh, just a quick correction here. I think as part of the summit, they also made it clear that they're bringing this feature to server but they may limit the number of executions you can run uh, from, yeah. from the standard plan too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's out of the box now with cloud premium. Yeah. It's coming for server out of box. Um, if, are you on a cloud instance now? Standard cloud, I believe. Yeah. They're on standard cloud. Yeah. That's what you mentioned. Yeah. Yep. Upgrade to cloud premium and you'll, you'll get it. And Joe, uh, Joseph Purcell had a question as well on there. Okay. Um, we have the question is, I said I'm a little late for this, so I'm sorry. Or did I miss it? David, Joe had a question, right? Um, no, we didn't see anything. Uh, it's anything. in the chat. In the uh, chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, the regular uh, chat. This is this is Joseph. It, I put it in the chat if you can read it. Yeah. yeah so I see now it's a script runner question. Uh, yeah. If you're, if this is suitable, if not. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yes, it's possible. Um. Well, I, I will need to give you the code. What are you agreeing to, Daniel? 
So let's say here, let's, re let's recite the question. Let's yes, recite sorry. the question. <laughs> yeah, so he had asked, uh, he'd like to know how to check for a specific label as a condition in a fast track script runner post function. So basically, if the label is true, execute the post function. If not, then bypass the post function. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's totally possible. It's just a matter of scripting. Nothing we can show right now, or at least a, 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 a beginning of how that scripting would look like, right? Yeah, getting started would be a great help. Daniel? Okay, yeah, you can go to add post function. Oh, you're going you're gonna, to, I'm driving, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're driving, Daniel, for navigator. Oh, boy. Buckle up, folks. Um, All right. Then the script runner for post function. All right. And there you have some options of, you can use either fast track transition issue. We can have uh, the run script, which will be a customized script. Go down to options, yeah, that one. And we need to, to create the validation there. If, if the field label has certain values, execute, execute the, the post function, or if, if it doesn't have the, uh, the labels that you're looking for, don't execute the post function. Uh, I don't have the code right now, but we can do an example and send it to you later. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. I would love that. Yeah, and then uh, I can give an example of one that we've got built on this workflow where it's it's selecting a the approver um, based on multiple pieces of criteria. Let me go back here. I'm I'm pretty comfortable with doing it for custom fields, but when it comes to issue fields, that's a little more than I've ever experienced. So um, that's what I'm confused about. How do you access system fields and then do the check? Yeah, and especially when the uh, system field has more than one option, such as labels yes. or components, uh, it, the code change a little bit from the custom fields. But yeah, I can help with that. Okay. Daniel's a steely-eyed script runner programmer, so yeah. you can get the hands there. So let's take a look here. There's a there's a post function in script runner here. We uh, it's called a approver matrix. Uh, we have this in play at a couple of different clients uh, that basically um, uh, selects an approver um, based on multiple pieces of criteria that exist on the ticket. So uh, let's see here. Here we go. Danny, oh, I see. Yes. This. And so basically based on your department or mm -hmm. um, location, uh, region, et cetera, it will then pick from a list of unique approvers. Um, and uh, we were always happy and willing to share kind of how, how this works mm -hmm. for any of, our, any of our customers. So okay. it's just a post function that runs and it keeps the approver matrix out of the hands of the um, ITSM guys that are trying to figure out who the approver of the week is. Yeah. That, that's a great application. That's a great uh, use case. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, yeah, we talked a lot about uh, add-ons to really enable, because really we find, you know, most of the demand comes in, um, you know, how, how can we uh, do X, Y, and Z? I, again, for those of you guys that might uh, be facing objections of, I didn't think it could do that, um, you'll be with either one of these add-ons or these add-ons in concert, the answer becomes a, a very solid, uh, simple yes, that you can enable um, a, that level of complexity um, and uh, maybe even help overcome um, other issues that could be com com competitive related to. There's another um, vendor trying to offer the ITSM tool because it does X and maybe we didn't understand that JIRA can. Uh, if, if it's in concert with the right add-ons. So, um, and then, uh, what was I gonna say? And then one other place that we see those three coming into play, since intake is so important, since getting the right data in the right spot is so important automatically, 
as much automation as we can as a best practice, um, it really leads to better reporting. So this is kind of the soapbox of, of well, if, if you guys are ha having objections from leadership over your JIRA instance, over the type of data that you're getting or not getting or not rolling up, I'd strongly recommend using uh, script runner and post functions and um, automation for JIRA for handling those things that aren't getting updated by people for the sake of rolling those things up into, into senior level reporting. So it's just, it's another angle to look at those from and say, okay, well, let's start automating the population of that field. Let's start, um, let's start setting up post functions that set certain fields based on other criteria. Um, another use case that I've got that I can share with you guys was the incidence severity was not getting set correctly for one of my government clients, which meant this was extremely important. And so there was all this upstream criteria for selecting the right severity of an incident. And we're talking nuclear <laughs> level stuff. <laughs> so um, I don't have it scripted here, and of course I can't show, but here's the deal. Between automation, presenting the right screens, putting on a workflow enforcement through Script Runner that I had to have certain fields and certain things validated, by the time that thing posted, Jira was calculating the severity of the incident based on all that other upstream criteria. It was no longer in the eye of the beholder of how severe the incident might be. So just other ways to handle those other types of business problems or those other types of uh, cultural or behavioral problems, you can start um, really managing those um, and say, oh, okay, I'll tell you what, well, let's put in a post function and people just don't have to think about it. Or, you know what, let's, let's, I can build a multi-tier set of criteria that post data that won't, wouldn't require uh, human intervention to make that distinction, right? And then queue it appropriately, email it appropriately, um, notify the right kind of people, use all those things uh, confidently to know like, oh man, I've got this tool belt now between those three add-ons. Um, yeah, we can, uh, we can start working on uh, behavioral enforcement data integrity enforcement. So that's just another way to come at and look at those things. Awesome, thanks Jeff. Yeah. Well, for anybody who's left over, we gotta, we gotta do a little Plinko. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying we're done, and some people can stay after for sure, but I might as well use this interlude, right? Yeah. That's very, it's very important. Very. <laughs> All right, hold on. All right, you see how uh, everybody can see my my screen here, right? It's a big plinko board. No, they don't see your screen yet. You don't. Hold on. Oh, there you go. He, he means you can see my video, right? Video. So if yeah. nobody else talks, I think it'll be on me, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there's all the logos down there. I'm gonna drop a ball. <laughs> okay. One second. Are you sharing your screen? No. Hey, so I, I, Patrick, I think the issue is you, you may have two different accounts going. So uh, the audio isn't coming <laughs> to the same one you're doing video on. So I think if everybody clicks gallery view in the top right corner, it'll let you see the video again. Thanks everybody for joining. Any, uh, yeah, any, anybody please again, feel free to reach out. Um, yes. We're open books and uh, love, love talking about this stuff. So great meeting you and thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jeff.